With Russian history, one central theme dominates all. That is, the undying tension between authoritarianism and liberty. From Ivan the Terrible to Catherine the Great, Stalin to Putin, repression and fear have been political tools to advance the aims of the government and silence dissenting voices. Welcome to Intrigued Mind. Today, we take a look at the incredible stories of two dissenters in the history of Russia, whose bravery in their condemnation of tyranny and widespread social evils would ultimately cost them their lives. Saint Philip was a Russian monk who became Metropolitan of Moscow during the notorious reign of Ivan the Terrible. Born into Russian nobility, he at first tried service at the Russian court. So as not to embroil himself in the turmoil of Regent Elena's reign, he left politics and turned to shepherding before entering a monastery at Solovetki in the northwest of Russia. Starting out as an ironworker and baker, Philip eventually became the monastery's abbot. An excellent administrator, Philip revived the monastery, overseeing construction for two cathedrals as well as storehouses and canals, among other achievements. He caught the attention of Ivan the Terrible, who it is believed was friends with Philip in childhood, and Ivan offered him the vacant Metropolitan See of Moscow, basically the Russian Archbishopric. During this period in the 1560s, Ivan was overseeing a ruthless purge of the Russian nobility in a deliberate government policy called Opryknina. State police scoured the country, confiscating noble lands and executing Russian nobles, called the boyars, by the thousands. Ivan's paranoia had driven him to believe that all of the boyars were intent on his downfall and ready to betray him at any opportunity. At a meeting of the church council, Philip, not yet metropolitan, demanded that Ivan cease his tyrannical purge. This, he stated, was his only condition to preside over the Holy See. Ivan, containing his rage, cautioned that Philip would do well to accept the post and not to interfere in the policy. The message was clear, accept or else. Hand tied, Philip swore an oath and was duly appointed Metropolitan on July 24, 1566. As Ivan's terror persisted, the rift between the paranoid autocrat and the Metropolitan widened. Philip's frequent condemnations led Ivan to push for the Metropolitan's arrest, but he failed to rally the support of the Ecclesiastic Council. At two church services in March 1568, Philip publicly lambasted members of the Oprichniki, the state police tasked with the enforcement of the Oprichnina policy. How long will you shed the innocent blood of your faithful Christian people, he cried from his pulpit. How long is this injustice to last? Turning to Ivan, he roared, Remember that God may have raised you in the world, but you are yet a mortal man and will exact payment for innocent blood shed by your hands. With that, he refused to bless Ivan for ongoing massacres of the nobility. A fuming Ivan is said to have replied, I have been too merciful, Metropolitan. I will give you something to complain about. Philip was swiftly deposed from office and sentenced to perpetual imprisonment on trumped-up charges of sorcery and decadence. After he publicly called God's wrath on Ivan, Ivan sought to degrade him further. Philip was confined in a dark and narrow prison cell. He was left to starve, fettered with heavy chains around his arms, neck, legs, and loins. Even at this stage, the Tsar grew restless with the insubordinate priest. Ivan ardently believed he possessed absolute, God-given power over his subjects, and Philip's audacious challenge caused Ivan's rage to consume him. Legend has it, the Tsar ordered that a wild, half-starved bear be sent into his cell. When Ivan visited the next day, he expected to find a mangled, lacerated corpse. Instead, he found Philip standing in prayer, while the bear was quietly snoozing in a corner of the cell. As the miracle story goes, at least. Another miracle was said to have been witnessed by the guards. This was Philip's chains breaking apart as the priest sung his psalms. Although significantly weakened by the lack of food, Philip simply would not die. The restless Tsar was compelled to act, and definitively. In December 1569, Ivan's aide and minion, Malyuta Skuratov, visited Philip in his cell, demanding that the bishop bless the Tsar and renounce his attacks. Philip refused once again. His last words? I have long awaited death. Let the Tsar's will be fulfilled. He then returned to read his scripture for the dying, before the assassin carried out his orders, either by strangulation or smothering with a pillow. Officials would tell the Russian people his death resulted from overbearing heat in his cell. Saint Philip died a martyr, and he was canonized as an Eastern Orthodox saint in 1652, nearly a century after his death. Two centuries after Saint Philip's time, 
Another charismatic leader was stirring up trouble. This was a man who also condemned the evils of tyranny and the injustices of Tsarist Russia. But unlike St. Philip, his opposition went beyond a personal feud with the Tsar. It spread to the masses. This man was intent on revolution, and in one of the greatest acts of deception in history, he came close to getting it. This man was Yemelyan Pugachev. Yemelyan Pugachev was the leader of the greatest popular insurrection in 18th century Russia. Born into an illiterate Cossack family during the early 1740s, Pugachev enlisted into the Russian army at age 17. After service in the Seven Years' War and the Russo-Turkish War of 1768-74, he deserted from the Russian army because his request for a discharge was denied, in spite of his battle wounds. For several years, he lived as a fugitive, wandering among Cossack settlements on the Terek River, as well as among old believers. This was a dissident community who upheld the teachings of East Orthodox Christianity prior to the church reforms of the mid-1600s. Always one step ahead of the law, he frequently used trickery and disguise to evade capture. He had a knack for impersonation, an attribute which would aid him later on in life. During his adventures, he caught wind of the Earl Cossack Rebellion of 1772 at Yatsk in modern-day Kazakhstan. He learned that it had been violently quelled by Tsarist troops. Pugachev had grown to despise the Russian government and wished to improve the lot of his countryfolk most severely affected by the miserable socio-economic realities of 18th century Russia. It was in the disgruntled, tax-burdened Cossacks where Pugachev saw his opportunity to break the status quo. Testing the subversive spirit of the Cossacks, he suggested, while posing as a wealthy merchant, a mass exodus to Turkey. To Pugachev's great delight, the Cossacks were on board. Though he was arrested and imprisoned for five months shortly after, Pugachev escaped and returned to his burgeoning following, promising to restore Cossack privileges as well as the so-called old belief. It was at that point that he took on his most famous disguise, a bold and almost vaudeville-esque endeavor, but which worked like clockwork in pre-industrial Russia. This new identity was none other than Tsar Peter III. Peter was the unpopular Tsar who was deposed in 1762, widely believed to have been assassinated on the orders of Catherine the Great, whose murderous coup led her to occupy the throne. Under his new identity, Pugachev claimed he and his generals had escaped from her tyranny and sought to reclaim the throne that was rightfully his. Declaring an alternate government, Pugachev decreed the abolition of serfdom, promising reform and the overthrow of Catherine's regime. Through propaganda and mass recruitment, he amassed an army of thousands of Cossacks, peasants, and clergymen. He would stage elaborate welcome ceremonies whenever he entered a new village, while priests who had rallied to his cause called on their communities to revolt. Catherine the Great initially saw Pugachev as a joke, or a nuisance at best. Only a small bounty was placed on his head, and the insurrection was expected to be quashed in no time. In 1774, however, the rebellion was making serious and increasingly dangerous ground. Pugachev's massive support base and rapid acquisition of artillery and arms brought him sweeping victories over government forces. Huge swaths of land between the Volga and the Urals were taken. Catherine's regime was on thin ice. In July 1774, the taking of Kazan, a major city in southwest Russia, was a wake-up call to the autocratic state. Scores of government forces even defected to the rebel side, while the city was burned by the rebels. As government forces pressed on with counter-offensives, the tide began to turn. Pugachev suffered heavy defeats at Kazan. He escaped via the Volga River and was able to recruit more followers from towns along the West Bank. In August 1774, he struck hard again at Tsaritsyn, today known as Volgograd, but failed to capture the city. In September of that same year, the insurrection was finally crushed in the steppe outside Tsaritsyn. Around 10,000 soldiers of the peasant army were killed or imprisoned. Pugachev tried to escape once again. Alas, his luck had run out. Too much blood had been spilt. Too many hopes for greater freedom. Dashed. Pugachev's Cossacks betrayed him to the government. He was thrust into a metal cage, interrogated, and sent to Moscow for public execution. On the 21st of January, 1775, he was decapitated, then drawn and quartered in one of Moscow's main squares. In the aftermath of the rebellion, Cossack privileges were cut even further, and government control was reinstated across the country with an even tighter fist. The abolition of serfdom would have to wait for another hundred years. For more videos on the most amazing forgotten parts of our history, be sure to subscribe to the Intrigued Mind channel. Like the video and leave your suggestions in the comments below.